Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. So yeah, our topic today is how FAIR has democratized their machine learning feature store framework at scale. But before we get into all of that, I um, want to do a little bit deeper of an intro. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Rafi. I'm a senior data engineer at FAIR. Um, I have, um, at FAIR, I've had the opportunity to work on some very, very interesting and cool work, uh, and I'm super excited to be sharing that, uh, some of that with you all today. Um, I'm based out of Toronto, and also I'm a big Formula One sports fan. So again, hi, Victoria. I am a senior customer success manager at Astronomer. For those that don't know, Astronomer is one of the driving forces behind Apache Airflow, and where I have the pleasure of supporting companies like FAIR on their modern data orchestration journey. Um, it's really been a highlight of my career to get to work with FAIR. They've actually been a company that I've long admired from the sidelines, and their data team is really impressive, as you're going to see with the use case that Rafe is going to present. I do know we might be a little short on time for questions, um, but Rafe is actually going to do a webinar version of this talk on the Astronomer website on November 30th, and there'll also be a live Q&A there as well. Um, okay, so today we will be talking about how we have managed to democratize a uh, machine learning framework, uh, feature store framework at FAIR. And what we mean by democratization here is to enable everyone to contribute to a central and shared resource, uh, maintaining some standard. So we will explain how we have uh, built a framework on top of Airflow by leveraging its very low level APIs and how we have managed to scale it for our needs. Um, in this talk, we also want to emphasize how Airflow is more than just a workflow management tool and why it can be so good for enabling less technical personas. So a little bit about uh, FAIR as well. Um, FAIR is an online wholesale marketplace that was founded in 2017 with a simple vision to help businesses uh, come together and compete on a more level playing field and discover the next best sellers from independent brands across the globe. Yeah, so FAIR really set out to transform wholesale with an online marketplace that helps simplify and provide a really enjoyable experience for independent retailers to find the right products for their shops. They've really taken a data-driven approach to unburden retailers from decade-long obstacles of finding those right products uh, for their shops. And... Um, most of their customer base is independent retailers, and what I mean by that is maybe a unique boutique in your local Main Street in downtown, or an online gift store that focuses on um, handmade goods from around the world. So they've really um, taken that data-driven approach to enable retailers to uh, find the right products online, and they also support the brands by providing them with powerful sales, marketing, and analytics tools to simplify their business um, and allow them to do what they love, making great products. Um, so today, FAIR operates in 17 countries, covering the US and Canada, and currently expanding into Europe and Australia. Um, and the platform supports over 700,000 retailers and 100,000 brands. Um, to set the stage for the use case that we'll explore today, uh, let me give you some context on how search works at FAIR. So brands and retailers on FAIR would usually start their journey from some form of search function on the website, whether it's the search bar, um, the category navigation, or like enhanced uh, user experiences such as similar products. Rafay, would you say that search is one of the most business critical components of the platform? Uh, definitely. You know, just like how Google search is an entry point for the web, um, search on FAIR is also an entry point for our retailers to discover new brands and products, which means that most of the user journey actually takes place on search. Um, improving and enhancing the search experience is directly linked to our GMV and business growth, actually. Uh, so it has a direct impact on GMV. GMV being uh, meaning gross merchandise value, or the merchandise value sold within a specific period of time. GMV is one of the most critical core sales metrics for FAIR or any e-commerce site. Um, so here's what happens when you search on FAIR. Um, yeah, so your query is tokenized uh, and used to retrieve a set of candidates from Elasticsearch. 
These candidates are used to retrieve a set of features from the online feature store, uh, which are then fed into the real-time ranker or the machine learning models to create a relevant search result. Um, although the online feature store is a very important component of this system, it mostly works as a low latency storage for feature retrieval. Um, the behemoth that powers uh, the online feature store is actually what we call the offline feature store that you see in, the, in this green box over here. Uh, with, this is responsible for all the feature calculations and eventually updating the online feature store. Uh, note that this architecture is what exists today, but it was not the same, like it, it wasn't always like this before. Uh, and we'll expand on that in the couple of uh, next few slides. All right, thanks for taking us through how FAIR works, um, or how search works at FAIR, but what exactly is the data org's role in enhancing the search experience? Um, yeah, great question. So our embedded data scientists are constantly yearning to improve, unlock the science behind search and improving its relevancy for our customers, right? So most of us would acknowledge that the search experience is very important in context of e-commerce, and this applies to uh, FAIR as well. So our data scientists are always experimenting with new features and machine learning models to improve the user experience. Um, so they would come up with new and experimental features which they think can improve the predictions. Um, features in this context can be anything, like the number of countries where a brand is sold in, or the average fulfillment days it's taking for, for orders. Um, so feature engineering and definition happens on the offline side, uh, and some of them are eventually propagated to the online feature store. All right, everyone, so let's jump in our time machine and go back to 2020 to 2022, when the teams were attempting to manage the feature store pipelines on their own. Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting time. Um, let me walk you through the typical data scientist workflow back then. So data scientists would usually start with experimenting some of their features and exploring their features and models on in Sage, SageMaker no notebooks. Um, they would iterate on a couple of uh, experimental features along with some existing features. Once new features are finalized uh, for model training, they would have to write their own ETLs for feature engineering. Uh, and in cases where they needed historical data for these features, they would have to somehow backfill them on their own. Uh, wow, so the data scientists were writing their own ETLs and trying to manage backfills all by themselves? Yeah, so uh, this approach had a lot of actually underlying issues back then. Um, first, there was no feature visibility across uh, different teams. Um, and, and the reason why that, that's the case is because you are writing your own ETLs here. Uh, which means that if you have a set of features defined in your own ETLs, other teams that might need to reuse those features would never know about them. Uh, and this creates like information silo. Teams would end up rewriting their own ETLs for the same set of features. Um, this would also prevent us uh, as an infrastructure team from distinguishing which features were available online because teams would build, build their own logic to update the online feature store, which in our case is powered by Redis. Um, this usually caused a lot of storage and scaling issues on Redis and became a burden on the platform team. I also previously mentioned the need for backfilling features in some cases. This was also very error prone because of a lack of understanding and tooling for techniques such as point in time joins in context of feature backfill. Um, and then with no standardized way of doing this, these backfill jobs would sometimes be done from local machines, uh, missing the entire PR review process and catching up on errors on those very um, costly backfills. And again, this, this sort of like scattered workflows would also have overhead, uh, associated cost overhead um, for the platform maintenance team, such as like AWS Elastic Cache uh, and Snowflake. So our goal to, was to resolve um, these issues with this new feature framework, uh, feature store framework. And with this, we managed to consolidate all the feature definitions with all features registered into a global feature registry. Um, now you just need to define a SQL file with a couple of uh, Python configurations uh, for your feature engineering tasks. Um, and we were also able to provide a very standard and simplified workflow for feature backfilling as you will see later in the talk. All right, so thanks for working, w walking us through that high level before and after. 
Um, I think it may be a good time now to jump into some code snippets from the Optimize framework and talk about what Airflow features were leveraged to do this at scale. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so we have built an in-house uh, feature store framework to resolve all these issues. Uh, and I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, so now, as you can see on the screen, all features are defined as SQL along with their Python conf configurations. So um, notice how you can provide the configurations separately for each, uh, each feature defined in SQL. Um, as an author, you also need to specify metadata that is internally used by the framework. For example, you can specify if the feature needs to be available, made available online. Uh, we have also enforced primitives such as uh, description of the feature uh, and the author name, uh, which is then eventually fed into something that we call the global feature registry. Now all this is made very modular by using high level data classes that you see on the right as configuration objects. Uh, these object definitions are internally passed into low level APIs to configure things like dynamic tasks, DAGs and backfills without the need for end users to understand the underlying low level implementations or like any need for even understanding how Airflow works. Um, this way of approaching the problem has enabled us to extend the framework for our future needs as well. All right, so, so far we've seen it takes a SQL file and a few configuration classes to, that need to be specified for feature engineering. But now let's take a look at what's actually happening within Airflow. Yeah, so uh, when a user defines a set of features, um, it is automatic, automatically imported into a framework DAG to group and generate a set of Airflow tasks. And you can see, see this on the left side. Um, these tasks pick up their configurations based on what is defined through data classes that I showed in the earlier slides. Now, from a platform maintenance perspective, the, the DAG code that's, that you see on right is barely 20 lines. However, it generates a pretty big DAG um, for all of these hundreds of feature engineering tasks dynamically uh, and also maintains an up-to-date data registry of available features. Um, and the beauty of it all is that it has absolutely no requirement from the end user to be able to know how Airflow works um, to perform any sort of like feature engineering. I, I do want to note here uh, that Having a shared framework that is used across your entire company comes with its own challenges. Uh, for example, generating hundreds of uh, tasks dyna dynamically during the DAG deployment is sometimes not ideal, especially if you have like larger use cases. Um, this can cause DAG parsing timeouts, especially if you deploy code frequently while tasks are executing. Um, however, what we have seen with Airflow is it's very strong and proactive open source community. We have seen a lot of these challenges go away with time with the introduction of uh, new and great features. For instance, when we started having uh, timeouts during the uh, during the DAG parsing for the feature store framework that we have written, uh, we were suggested to use dynamic task mapping in Airflow by our friends at Astronomer. Um, we were able to fully resolve the issue by covering these tasks, uh, by converting those tasks to dynamic task mapping with just a few lines of code. I actually have the small PR that made this huge uh, change in terms of the performance of DAG parsing and uh, preventing like things like zombie, uh, zombie tasks in Airflow. Uh, and the reason why this had such a major performance boost for us was that it deferred task generation to DAG execution time rather than the DAG parse time. Um, so at FAIR, we have been actually very proactive uh, in adopting new versions of Airflow and have an incredible amount, and have seen an incredible amount of new features and performance improvements, especially after Airflow 2.0. Um, some of the notable ones that has actually helped us scale a lot has been dynamic task mapping, as you have seen in the previous slides, uh, task groups for, uh, for easier DAG manager, management, especially for very large DAGs, and deferable operators and triggers for long running tasks such as AWS batch jobs. Um, and also like running Airflow on, astro on Astronomer has also really helped us to keep up to date with the versions and accessing the latest features. Rafay, I know that you leverage dynamic DAG generation for those really error prone backfills, but what did that look like in practice and um, how did it improve the experience for the team? Um, 
Yeah, so, so remember how we talked about keeping the, the framework extensible, right? Um, so earlier this year, we really support for backfilling within the, within the framework. Um, the only thing that end users would now have to specify to enable their backfill was just the start and the end time, uh, end dates, and a namespace string. Um, and, that, and that's all. The underlying framework that we have built would take care of dynamically generating uh, DAGs for the user. It would use the same feature engineering SQL that uses users define for their daily runs with an extra flag that allows them to build some extra logic such as uh, point in time joins for their backfills. Now, notice on the right hand side um, how start and end dates are passed to the internal implementation of the airflow operator. The granular control allows us to have different start and end dates for features within the same backfill DAG. Um, and you can literally do these massive backfills by just writing three lines of code and that's it. Like as a data scientist, if you need to do a big backfill, you don't actually need to worry about any infrastructure or like how it works. You just define a config and that's it. So to support backfilling within the framework, uh, we also standardize stable snapshotting using our custom airflow operators. Uh, and this is generally a best practice. What we have seen is uh, we generally use Python mixins to extend operator functionalities. This allows us to use the existing low level APIs, uh, but like keep them intact, n n not breaking them while adding additional features on top. Uh, for example, we, dis we did this with our custom rebuild operator by implementing a snapshot mixin uh, that now allows users to specify if their tables should be snapshotted at a cer certain frequency. So this together with the feature store framework that we have built has accelerated wide adoption at FAIR and enabled uh, data scientists to effecti effectively perform feature engineering and model training at scale. Yeah, Rafay, it really is so impressive, and you and the entire FAIR team should be really proud of the experience that you've been able to build out for the data scientists. I do want to take a second now to switch gears. Um, everyone knows that Airflow is great for basic workflow management, but Rafay, I know you're really passionate that it extends beyond that. Do you want to go into that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, I, I think that Airflow goes way beyond just a workflow management tool. Uh, it's not just just the scheduler that supports writing custom fancy operators. Um, I think the way it's designed makes it very extensible and, and powerful as you have seen in our use case. Um, if you understand the underlying concepts of Airflow, which are very well documented, it makes it so much easier to build and maintain a very stable data and ML infrastructure. Uh, in our case of Feature Store, maintaining the infra SLA uh, is very critical for the stability of our platform. And if we are not able to do that, it could potentially break mission critical features such as search on FAIR website. Um, and these SLAs also apply to Airflow because it's such a major piece of uh, our technical ecosystem. Um, we have also found Airflow to be a very stable part of our infrastructure and with help from some, uh, uh, from Astronomer, we have been able to scale it out and continue to do so. Um, some of the practices, some of the best practices that I would put emphasis on based on our own experiences is uh, proactively considering uh, upgrading and onboarding to the latest Airflow versions, even if you don't necessarily need new features from the, the new release. And, and the reason why I say that is, uh, for example, in our case, we, we weren't using dynamic task mapping for that feature store deck, but when, but when there was an actual need for it, we were able to quickly onboard to, to that feature of Airflow without doing a major cluster upgrade. Yeah, Rafi, I'm really glad that you mentioned that in your talk, um, how important keeping up to date with the Airflow versions are. That's something that we at Astronomer really evangelize with our customers and something that we um, you know, work very closely with our customers on and are trying to make easier every day. Um, uh, I would also say do not limit yourself by thinking that Airflow is only a workflow management tool and you just use it to write your ETL deck. In the use case that we have shared today, uh, we have showed how you can use it to build very nice and usable frameworks that can accelerate wide adoption and onboard people with less technical personas. Um, and finally, having some underlying understanding of Airflow does help with the thoughtful usage and design of your custom APIs. 
which eventually goes a long way in keeping your data pipeline very stable and uh, not missing SLAs. Um, for credits, I would like to give a shout out to Wayne, one of our principal engineers, for his guidance on the offline feature store framework that we have built, um, and our AE team for their in-depth feedback on table snapshot tooling that I uh, showed earlier, and of course our core data infra and MLP teams for consistently striving uh, to support um, to support us through various uh, operational work within Airflow and Snowflake and uh, to my wife for her constant support during my work uh, on this talk. All right, Rafe, thank you so much for walking us. <laughs> yeah, big round of applause.